What just shook the deep Pacific waters off Oregon's coast, and why should anyone who cares about how Earth moves pay attention? Could this sudden slip be a one-off release of built-up strain, or is it a small door opening on a much larger mechanical system? And finally, might a jolt far out at sea somehow whisper its way into the slow, locked menace of the Cascadia subduction zone? These questions are not idle curiosities. They are the heart of modern seismology, how faults break, how plates trade stress, and how one crack in the ocean floor fits into the larger machinery of a tectonic margin. On January 16th, 2026, instruments recorded a magnitude 6.0 earthquake off the southern Oregon coast at latitude 43.697 degrees north and longitude 128.030 degrees west. The hypocenter sat at a depth of 7.1 kilometers, about 4.4 miles below the seafloor. The event occurred within the realm of the Blanco Fracture Zone, an active transform plate boundary that stitches together the spreading centers of the Northeast Pacific, the Juan de Fuca Ridge to the north and the Gorda Rise to the south. Because the motion on this boundary is primarily horizontal and because the slip is dominantly right lateral, the earthquake produced strong ground motion close to its epicenter but did not generate a damaging tsunami. To understand the significance of this tembler, it helps to picture the Blanco Fracture Zone as a long, rough seam in the ocean floor. Transform faults such as this are where plates slide past each other laterally, rather than one plate diving beneath another or two plates pulling apart. In the Blanco system, the Pacific Plate and the Juan de Fuca plate move past each other in a right lateral sense. Standing on one side of a fracture, you would see the other side moving to your right. That sideways motion accumulates shear stress along fault segments until it is released in earthquakes. These faults are young in geological terms and lie on oceanic crust that is relatively warm and fractured. So strain is accommodated in a distributed way across multiple fault strands rather than in a single long locked segment. The result is frequent moderate earthquakes and occasional larger shocks when a longer stretch of fault finally breaks. Mechanically, a strike-slip earthquake like this is characterized by near horizontal rupture, with the dominant movement along the fault plane parallel to the surface. The seismic waves radiate energy chiefly as shear motion rather than as vertical uplift, which explains why tsunami risk is low for events focused on pure strike-slip motion. The depth matters too. At 7.1 kilometers below the seafloor, the rupture occurred within brittle crust, where rocks still respond by fracturing rather than flowing. That depth is well within the zone that produces most tectonic earthquakes and corresponds to the part of the oceanic lithosphere that records stress redistribution cleanly for seismologists to study. This is not the first time the Blanco has produced notable earthquakes. The Fracture Zone has a catalogue of recorded events that includes at least 26 shocks of magnitude 6 or larger. One of the largest instrumentally recorded events on, or very near, the Blanco occurred in March of 1985, a magnitude 6.5 earthquake located roughly 259 kilometers west of Bandon, Oregon, which is about 160.9 miles offshore. That event, along with subsequent magnitude 6 and magnitude 6.3 shocks, demonstrates that the Blanco is capable of producing mid to upper six magnitude earthquakes on a time scale of decades. The pattern we observe is consistent with the mechanics of oceanic transforms, frequent moderate events with the occasional larger rupture when multiple fault patches slip in concert. 
Estimating the largest possible earthquake for a given fault or fault system is both a technical and practical exercise. Seismologists combine observations of past earthquakes, the geometry and length of mapped fault segments, the slip rate of the plates, and empirical relationships that connect rupture length and area to earthquake magnitude. For transform systems such as the Blanco, rupture length is particularly important. The longer the portion of fault that slips in a single event, the larger the earthquake. The Blanco has segments that are tens of kilometers long, and because the Juan de Fuca plate is relatively narrow and warm, it tends to break up into several fault strands rather than acting like a single, strong, continuous plate. That structural fragmentation limits the maximum plausible rupture length compared to the enormous megathrusts beneath subduction zones. Using these empirical scaling concepts and the observed fault lengths in the Blanco region, the consensus among many marine tectonic studies places the likely upper bound for individual Blanco rupture events in the high 6 magnitudes to the low 7 magnitudes. In plainer terms, magnitude 6.5 to magnitude 7.0 earthquakes are realistic, and magnitude 7.5 and above become increasingly unlikely, primarily because the physical fault lengths and the warm, fractured nature of the oceanic plate do not readily support rupture of the scale needed to produce those larger magnitudes. The difference matters. A magnitude 7 earthquake has a rupture dimension, an energy release that is an order of magnitude greater than a magnitude 6 event, and those differences change how stress is redistributed around the rupture. Slip rate also plays a role in estimating seismic potential. The relative motion between the Pacific Plate and the Juan de Fuca Plate along the Blanco is on the order of 50 millimeters per year, which is roughly 2 inches per year. That rate is modest compared to some global plate boundaries, but is sufficient over decades and centuries to load significant elastic strain on faults. Because this motion is steady, the fault system generates earthquakes repeatedly over time. However, because the plate fragments into several fault strands, the strain tends to be released in multiple smaller ruptures rather than a single massive rupture. Beyond estimates of maximum magnitude, the physical structure of the oceanic crust and mantle beneath the Blanco matters for how stress travels. Ambient noise tomography and other seismic imaging techniques allow scientists to peer into the subsurface by analyzing how background seismic noise and small earthquakes propagate. These methods show complicated structures under the Blanco and indicate that the transform fabric might continue eastward beneath the subducting Juan de Fuca slab in places. That possibility is important because it suggests that the geologic history of transform motion can be preserved and even folded into the subduction geometry as the oceanic plate dives beneath North America. If transform-related heterogeneity is carried into the subduction system, it could locally influence the mechanical behavior of the megathrust interface although the effect is subtle and not a straightforward cause of large megathrust earthquakes. Which brings us to the perennial worry. Can a quake on the Blanco fracture zone influence the Cascadia subduction zone? The Cascadia megathrust is the region where the Juan de Fuca plate dives under the North American plate, and that interface is capable on long recurrence intervals of producing a megathrust earthquake of magnitude 9 or so with continent scale consequences. The Blanco, by contrast, sits outboard of that subduction zone and accommodates transform motion in the oceanic plate. The two systems are part of the same plate tectonic neighborhood. They share the same plates and therefore share the global pattern of forces. 
but sharing a neighbourhood does not mean immediate mechanical coupling in the short term. Stress transfer between faults can occur in two principal ways, static and dynamic. Static stress change is the permanent reshaping of the stress field after a rupture, typically significant close to the rupture and decaying rapidly with distance. Dynamic stress transfer comes from passing seismic waves that can transiently increase or decrease the likelihood of failure on distant faults, and it depends both on the wave amplitudes and on the sensitivity of the receiving fault. For the Blanco and Cascadia, the distances involved and the typical sizes of Blanco earthquakes limit the potential for meaningful static stress triggering of the subduction interface. The Cascadia megathrust lies roughly 200 kilometers or more to the east of typical Blanco epicenters. Static stress perturbations decay with distance and with the geometry of the faults, and for moderate rupture sizes on the Blanco, the expected static stress change at the megathrust would be very small. Dynamic triggering is more complicated. Strong seismic waves from a very large earthquake can perturb stress and fluids on distant faults and possibly advance the timing of an earthquake. But in practice, dynamic triggering of a megathrust by moderate offshore transform earthquakes is rare and requires exceptional circumstances. The prevailing view is that moderate Blanco events are unlikely to trigger a Cascadia megathrust rupture. That is not the same as impossible in some theoretical sense, but the physics and past observations do not support an immediate, direct causal link. Another fundamental aspect is the thermal and rheological character of the oceanic plate. The Juan de Fuca plate is relatively young and warm. Warm lithosphere is more ductile at depth and tends to accommodate deformation over broader zones rather than concentrating strain on very long single faults. That characteristic further inhibits the occurrence of very large coherent ruptures in the Blanco region. Instead, the plate's internal weakness and distributed deformation favor repeated moderate shocks and swarms. Swarms, episodes where many earthquakes occur within a short time and in a confined area, are a hallmark of transform systems with complex fault networks. They reflect the progressive failure of small interacting patches of the crust as stress redistributes among them. Seismologists study each sizable Blanco earthquake thoroughly because every event is both data and experiment. The shape of the rupture, the orientation of the fault plane that slipped, the depth distribution of aftershocks and the spectrum of seismic waves all tell a consistent geological story. Instruments on land and on the seafloor record how energy radiated and that radiation pattern reveals whether the event was a pure strike slip or had components of dip slip motion. Modern seismic networks can resolve these details quickly and feed them into hazard assessments. For a magnitude 6.0 event at 7.1 kilometers depth, the main scientific tasks are to determine the rupture plane and its direction of slip, map the aftershock zone, and compare the new data with older seismic catalogues and with seismic velocity models derived from ambient noise and controlled source studies. Practically speaking, for coastal communities, a Blanco transform earthquake like this one is a local story. It can core the sensors, rattle ships, or offshore platforms if they are close enough, and briefly trigger earthquake alarms inland. Because the motion is horizontal, tsunami hazard is minimal unless there is an unexpected vertical displacement, which is rare for this style of faulting. The deeper, more consequential concern for the continental margin remains the Cascadia subduction interface, whose behavior is governed by long-term stress accumulation and the slow slip and locking along the mega thrust. 
isolated Blanco events have not been observed to prompt rapid changes in Cascadia's locked portion in any sustained way. That said, these offshore events are valuable for science beyond immediate hazard. They illuminate fault geometry where direct observation is impossible. They test our seismic imaging methods, and they help refine rupture models that feed into probabilistic seismic hazard assessments. Over time, databases of Blanco earthquakes help researchers estimate recurrence intervals for different magnitude ranges, verify slip rates, and better map where transform fabric either ends or continues beneath the accretionary prism and the subducting slab. In particular, if ambient noise tomography and other geophysical methods continue to suggest that the Blanco fabric extends beneath the subducting slab, that could prompt new lines of research into how transform heterogeneity affects fault strength and the distribution of slow slip or tremor on the mega thrust. The immediate fallout from this magnitude 6.0 event is mostly scientific. Seismologists will use the recordings to refine the fault map, update focal mechanism catalogues, and feed the event into models of regional stress and plate motion. For residents on shore, the message is familiar. This was a significant offshore earthquake. It was consistent with the known behavior of the Blanco fracture zone, and it does not indicate that the Cascadia megathrust has suddenly become more likely to rupture. For scientists, the event is an opportunity to keep sharpening the tools used to interpret oceanic fault behavior. In the end, what happened off Oregon on January 16th is geology doing what geology does. Plates move, strain builds, and brittle rocks fail when their strength is exceeded. The Blanco fracture zone, with its right lateral motion and network of faults, will continue to produce strong but generally bounded earthquakes. Based on fault geometry, slip rates, and historical behavior, the Blanco is most likely to produce earthquakes in the magnitude 6 to magnitude 7 range, with the high 6s to low 7s marking the practical upper limit for single ruptures under present geologic conditions. The subduction megathrust to the east remains the dramatic long-term concern for the Pacific Northwest, but the Blanco's tremors are large its own story, an active oceanic transform performing the small but telling work of reshaping the seafloor, one rupture at a time. If this rocked your brain, smash the like button, share it with fellow science fans, subscribe for more deep dive geology, and tap that hype icon to help this video reach a wider audience.